Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. All right. My name is Martha Cole. I'm a historical specialist here at the Montana Historical Society, and I am delighted to welcome you to the sixth presentation in our series, Montana History in Nine Easy Lessons. If you missed some of the earlier presentations, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Um, also, uh, links to the presentations are on our website program page. I invite you to come back next week for Montana and the Cold War. Uh, and I will uh, remind you, if you're an educator and you want an OPI renewal, unit. I have forms here. If you've brought your form, I can sign your form after the talk or anyone at the front desk can sign that form for you. And now I'm absolutely delighted to um, introduce our speaker. Uh, Bob Swartout is Professor Emeritus of History uh, from Carroll College here in Helena, Montana, where he taught both United States and East Asian history from 1978 to 2014. His many publications include Mandarins, Gunboats, and Power Politics. What a uh, title. <laughs> 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 Owen, it gets longer. Owen Nickerson, Denny, and the International Rivalries in Korea. Uh, Montana Vistas, Selected Historical Essays, and Bold Minds and Blessed Hands, the First Century of Montana's Carroll College. In 20, uh, 2006, he received the Outstanding Educators Award from the Montana Historical Society Board of Trustees. And in early 2013, he was awarded the Governor's Humanities Award by the State of Montana and Humanities Montana. So. Please uh, join me in welcoming Bob Swartout. Thank you. And thank you, Martha. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's so much fun to be talking history, especially Montana's history, which is such an amazing and dramatic story. It's also an honor to be at the Montana Historical Society, which is, is truly one of the great history research centers found anywhere in the United States. We're unbelievably lucky to have a, an established like, establishment like this here in Montana. And I know scholars and historians from all across the country who would give their eye teeth to be able to live next door to this place and be able to do research on a regular basis. Uh, what a gem. And, and the staff here as well, an amazing collection of people who enrich our lives on a daily basis.
So, agriculture in Montana. It's been around as long as Montana's been around, even before Montana was created as a territory in 1864. Native Americans, of course, cultivated all sorts of agricultural crops going back centuries and centuries. When the first mining camps arose in the northern Rockies in the 1860s, farms quickly appeared surrounding those camps. Would-be farmers realized it was often safer to mine the miners rather than try and, trying to mine the gold and often uh, made a good profit uh, providing these early mining camps uh, with foodstuffs uh, that were so difficult to trek in from distant places. But those early agricultural activities tended to remain fairly minor, in part because the mining camps themselves would ebb and flow over time. By the mid-1870s, uh, the heyday for placer mining had already begun to, to uh, move away from the scene. Uh, as long as those agricultural activities were tied to those early mining camps, uh, it was difficult for that to become a major economic activity within the territory of Montana. And that would remain true even into the early years of statehood. Montana becomes a state in 1889. But then in the early 20th century, everything would change. What we often refer to as the farmer's frontier or the homestead boom, would be, in my mind, the most dramatic economic and social change in the entire history of Montana. Uh, the numbers alone bear that out. In 1900, uh, Montana's to total population was about 243,000 people, less than a quarter of a million, 243,000. By 1920, in just 20 years, the state's population was 548,000 people, plus or minus a few. 548,000. Now, not all of those people were farmers. Many new folks were being brought into Montana to work in the copper industry in Butte and Anaconda. But agriculture was at the heart of that explosion in Montana's population. I mean, think about that. In just two decades, the state's population grew by 125%. I mean, today, if, if we grew by, say, 20% or even 15% between one decade and another, we would think that that was phenomenal growth. Here in less than a quarter century, in just 20 years, the state grew by 125%. An astounding rate of growth, never to be seen again in Montana. That's never returned. So something special was happening. And of course, that something special was the homestead boom that would hit with a vengeance by the first decade of the 20th century. So as students of history, how can we explain that? What factors were coming together that would produce such an unprecedented rate of growth? Well, one factor was the availability of land. And in fact, uh, Laura Ferguson last week really helped to explain that to us when she talked about the fate of Native Americans during the reservation system. The reservations had, of course, been, most of them, created in the, in the 19th century. Almost as soon as they were created, they began to shrink under government pressure. And that continues on into the early 20th century. And as those reservations shrink then more and more land becomes available, particularly south of the Yellowstone and north of Missouri, for other purposes, to other peoples. And many of them would wind up being homesteaders. In fact, uh, that ties in with this first image that we have here today. This is an image that was taken uh, up near uh, Flathead Lake on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Again, Laura talked last, year, uh, last week about the issue of allotments. This is what happened when the Flathead Reservation had those land allotments. After certain pieces of land were made, of, made available to Native Americans, many other pieces of land within that area became available to non-Native peoples. And this is one example of that. The railroad had come in. In this case, it's the Great Northern Railroad. 
and hundreds and thousands of people are then coming into these areas in order to take advantage of these new lands that are available to the general public. So again, one factor here was the availability of new lands that had previously been part of Native American terrain. A second factor, of course, had to do with demographic and economic changes within America. Up through the American Civil War, the U.S. had been an overwhelmingly agrarian society. But in the aftermath of the Civil War, the Industrial Revolution hits America with full force. Between 1865 and 1900, America is industrializing at a phenomenal rate. Uh, when I taught at Carroll all those years, I often would mention to students that by 1900, you know, if you want to think about how America had changed, by 1900, as an industrial society, America was producing more steel than England and Germany combined. And most people of that era thought of England as Germany as being in the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. But here America, by 1900, was producing more steel than both of those nations combined. By 1920, for the first time in American history, census takers would discover that a majority of Americans, a majority of Americans, were now living in cities. And that was the byproduct of industrialization. With industrialization came urbanization. And thus dozens of cities, not three or four or five, not just New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, but dozens of cities would arise east of the Mississippi tied to that Industrial Revolution with populations in the hundreds of thousands and even millions. Well, those new urban workers needed to eat and they were no longer growing their own foodstuffs, as had been true for a rural America, a village America, even a small town America. The growth of those urban centers in the United States in the early 20th century then created a demand for places like Montana. So again, that was another reason for this unprecedented homestead boom. But how could you get your agricultural products of Montana to markets around the country? You know, that was one reason why you didn't see any significant growth of agriculture in the 1860s or 1870s or 1880s coming from Montana. You couldn't get to those other places. But of course, by the late 19th century, the railroads had arrived. The Northern Pacific Railroad, the first transcontinental railroad to cut all the way across Montana, is completed in 1883. A decade later, 1893, oh, incidentally, we, all, we always need to remember that the Northern Pacific Railroad was a land-grant railroad, meaning that for every mile of track laid, it would get roughly 20 sections of public land. What is it going to do with that land? Well, the railroad do, discovers a use for it by the early 20th century. 1893, Jim Hill's Great Northern Railroad is completed. That would run from the upper Great Lakes through Minnesota, across northern North Dakota, all the way across the High Line of Montana and out to Puget Sound. 1893. Incidentally, the, northern, the Great Northern Railroad was not a land-grant railroad. Of all the early transcontinental railroads, it was the only one which wasn't. But in part because of that, it meant that Jim Hill had to build in a somewhat more cautious manner. Pays you go, you might say. Which meant that he was always looking for people who would be willing to use his line as quickly as possible. That means that he needs to entice people out to the high line of Montana, places like that so that his railroad could begin turning a profit. So the Great Northern becomes a major player in this story. And then by 1909, another railroad, one that we sometimes forget about, the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul. It went by different names during different times. In Montana, we usually call it the Milwaukee Road, right? It was the last one to arrive, but it 
It opened up areas that previous railroads had not opened up. It would come through southeastern Montana and then all along the Muscle Shell Valley of central Montana. So you have the northern Pacific south of that. You have the great northern north of that. So now you have three major transcontinental railroads all cutting across Montana. In the case of the Northern Pacific, of course, they would be a major player in providing land. Again, those land grants that wind up being in the hands of homesteaders in many cases. But even with railroads that didn't have land grants, like the Great Northern, they now could provide the transportation to get Montana's agricultural products to national and even international markets. In fact, by 1910, as a state, Montana had more than 4,300 miles of lines laid down. Not just the three major lines that I talked about, but you have something called the Montana Central that would run from Great Falls down through Helena all the way to Butte, a north-south line that was connected to the Great Northern. You had other lines that I can't mention right now, but, but dozens of spur lines you know, you could travel all the way from Plentywood, Montana to, say, Lima, or Lima, if you will, in southwestern Montana, or to Eureka in another corner of Montana. You could go almost anywhere in the state by rail by the early 20th century. You have this, this web of railroads that connects Montanans to one another, but also then connects Montana to these markets that are growing by leaps and bounds beyond the state's boundaries. Another factor in this, this is, this is connected to the Industrial Revolution that I mentioned just a bit ago. If you hope to then cultivate the high plains, that territory that's west of the 98th meridian, how are you going to cut through that virgin topsoil? It's going to be a very difficult thing to do, cut through that sod. Well, that's where new technology comes in, byproducts of the Industrial Revolution, things like steel plows, the first industrial threshing machines. You know, back if you were farming on the East Coast, you wouldn't have needed a threshing machine, but it's a different kind of business if you're going to grow wheat on the Great Plains. Windmills, windmills will have to be sunk into the ground to boil water up for the local farm. Even the earliest form of tractors would appear at this time. So in fact, this industrial revolution produces a new generation of farm implements that would allow people to farm greater par parts of land, greater pieces of land in a much more effective fashion. Okay, so we've got farm implements, we've got the land, we've got markets, we've got a way of get, getting to those markets. But there is that other issue. You might recall that, oh, prior to the early 20th century, at least prior to the 19th century, Americans were often inclined to see the Great Plains region, particularly anything west of the 98th meridian, as a desert-like landscape. In fact, if you looked at American maps during the first half of the 19th century, the Great Plains would often be referred to as the Great American Desert. Now, of course, it wasn't really a desert landscape. Geographers would refer to it as a steppe landscape. But one of its characteristics, especially beyond the 98th meridian, was that you would generally have less than 20 inches of rainfall per year. Common sense seemed to suggest that wherever you had less than 20 inches of rainfall, it wasn't enough to sustain traditional agriculture. Not unless you could come up with a new technique for that sort of work. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. By the early 20th century, during the first decade of the 20th century, a farmer by the name of I want to make sure I don't forget his middle initial. Hardy Webster Campbell, uh, who had been farming for some time in South Dakota, began to promote this idea of dry farming. 
saying, in fact, you could successfully farm with less than 20 inches of rainfall if you did it in a new scientific way. And what did that mean? Well, among other things, it would mean crop rotation. You couldn't keep planting the same crop time after time. It also involved something which he called deep plowing, which would help to conserve the moisture that was in the soil. And another term we like to use, intensive cultivation. And historians have written entire books on this topic. Suffice it to say, Campbell suggested that if you bought into these new techniques, that you could be a successful farmer with less than 20 inches of rainfall per year. Uh, and there was some evidence to support his claims. Uh, one thing he, he tended not to talk that much about, but other people did, was the fact that if you're going to farm successfully in this dry climate, you'd probably have to increase the size of your farms. Uh, you couldn't make it with a kind of traditional piece of property, say a quarter section of land, 160 acres, that might be used in the east. You have to expand your operations because the yields wouldn't be the same. But of course, there were some writers then who tended to de-emphasize the scientific side of this and instead talked about something that was almost mystical. This is how one writer from Missouri put it, and this was still back in the 19th century. His name was Josiah Craig, and he, he talked about this, you know, is there this fixed barrier, say at the 9-8th meridian, that would prevent farming beyond that line. This is how he put it. The high plains seem too dry and lifeless to produce timber. Yet might not the vicissitudes of nature operate a change likewise upon the seasons? Why may we, my, why may we not suppose that the genial influence of civilization that extensive cultivation of the earth, and that's how he defines civilization, cultivation of the earth, might contribute to the multiplication of showers, as it certainly does of fountains. When you establish a new community, you build a town, you put a, a fountain in the, in the town square, more fountains here and there, why not more generous rainfall? Or that shady groves, as they advance upon the prairies, may have some effect upon the seasons. What's he talking about here? Well, well, in time, this becomes known as the notion. Let's see, I've got to make sure I use the right phrase here. Rain follows the plow. In other words, if you could sort of cultivate this landscape somehow you might actually then help to produce increased rainfall. Hmm, that would be nice if it could be done. <laughs> Again, there was no evidence to support that conclusion, but, but, but those kinds of stories began to make the rounds. And then you connect that to the theories or the ideas of Campbell, and people began to think, maybe we can make a go of it in a place that has less than 20 inches of rainfall per year. So you have this development of dry farming as a concept that also plays an important role in Montana. But there's another factor we have to take into account, and that's government policy. And more specifically, the US federal policy toward farmland, or in this case, various homestead acts. Now, of course, the first homestead act was passed during the Civil War in the 1860s. That act said that if you improved upon the land for a five-year five period of time, you paid a modest filing fee at the end of that five-year period, you could then receive a quarter section of land, free and clear, 160 acres. That had been on the books since the 1860s. 
but it hadn't had much of an impact on Montana because, of, most, of course, most people realized that that wouldn't be enough property to make a go of it. Remember Laura's talk last week about the Allotment Act, the Dawes Allotment Act. Uh, those parcels varied from place to place, but they were often roughly 160 acres. It explains why Native Americans have such a difficult time making a go of it, even if they wish to be traditional agriculturalists in that sense. So in fact, that original Homestead Act had only a modest influence on Montana. So what happens to change that in the early 19th century? Well, in 1909, Congress passes a new Homestead Bill. The 1909 Enlarged Homestead Act. In fact, a new U.S. Senator from Montana, Senator Joseph Dixon, is a major promoter of this bill, helps to write the bill. Under this law, instead of getting a quarter section of land, you can now get a full half section of land, 320 acres. You know, what if your siblings hmm, file on joint half sections, and then once you've proved up and get title, Combine those two so you'd have a full section of land, say 640 acres. That may be enough to make a go of it. Or what if your would-be spouses? You know, one of the unusual things about the Homestead Acts was that single women could file for a patent. And in fact, a substantial number of women did exactly that. And again, they filed as single. They are, they are the property owners once that five-year period had passed. Well, what if the adjacent half section is owned by someone that they fall in love with, or maybe they were already in love, but they said, well, let's hold off getting married until we get these patents, these titles to the land. And once they had done that, then they could combine the two. So again, now we have larger pieces of property that seem to be available for would-be homesteaders. That makes it a bit easier, but it's still pretty tough going. But then three years after that, and this, what's interesting here is this coincides with the heyday of the homestead boom in Montana. So I would suggest there's a cause and effect relationship here. In 1912, Congress passes another homestead act was usually referred to as the Three-Year Homestead Act, which meant that after just three years of proving up, you could then receive the title to that land. So you wouldn't have to do it for five, do it for just three, and now instead of a quarter section of land, you get a half section. Oh, and there's one other piece to this story, that according to the Three-Year Homestead Act that was passed in 1912, you could be absent from your property for up to five months a year and still not lose your claim to it. In a place like Montana, with its growing seasons, that was a criti element, critical element. It meant that, and this tended to be true if it was a couple that had settled on this property, it was often the male, the husband, the father in the family, who would then move into town for that five-month period and take another job for those five months to augment the family income. So again, it was another way of increasing your chances of making it in this challenging endeavor. So these federal policies play a very important role in explaining why this boom would hit Montana when it did. So we've got land, we've got markets, We've got access to those markets. We perhaps have a way of working the soil in a landscape that's rather dry. And we don't have to work that land as long as we did in the past in order to get title to it. But there was one other important element here. And that was the role of the boosters. That is, those people who would be encouraging would-be farmers 
to take a shot at Montana. And again, anytime you're trying to be a successful farmer in a place that with less than 20 inches of rainfall a year, where droughts perhaps could occur, it's going to be a tough life. My dad, my grandparents ran a farm in eastern North Dakota all through the early 20th century. My dad and my uncle were born and raised on that farm. That was eastern North Dakota. That was east of the 98th meridian where they had more than 20 inches of rainfall per year, and yet it was touch and go most of the time. It's really hard. For those of you who come from, from farming backgrounds, you know how challenging that can be, especially in Montana, given the light rainfall. So people needed to be encouraged to come out, and those providing the encouragement were the so-called boosters, they might be members of the local chamber of commerce. They were often local bankers who were eager to loan money to homesteaders. Now, if you were taking advantage of the Homestead Act or one of the Homestead Acts, you wouldn't necessarily have to buy your land, but you'd have to buy the implements to work that land. Farming was never free, right? And in many instances, uh, these new farmers in Montana in fact, we're buying the land, particularly from the Northern Pacific Railroad, thousands of acres passed into, into private hands uh, in that fashion. So it took money to, to buy your homestead if it was uh, a piece of property that the Northern Pacific had had. And that's what this image is all about. The Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul. Uh, there's a farmer tilling the soil. When he turns over the soil, what do we find? Coins coming out, gold coins. It's like, it's this magic bank account. You just dip your plow into the soil, and you're going to make money hand over fist. At least that's what's suggested here. Let's see. Oh, talking about the importance of the railroads. Uh, this is a trestle across the Two Medicine River. So this is a great northern trestle. So something about the engineering challenges here as you try to open up Montana to these agricultural opportunities. That's a Milwaukee Road locomotive. Now, I know I'm not supposed to ask questions of the audience because this program is being taped, but I'm going to do it anyway. What, what made the Milwaukee Road unique among all transcontinental railroads? It was electrified, right? We see evidence of it right there. A pretty amazing accomplishment in that regard. So these railroads are important as a way of getting crops to market, but the railroads were also very active boosters. They needed to sell people on the wonders of Montana if they were going to be able to encourage settlers in and thus turn a profit for themselves. So let me read to you some classic booster literature. This was a pamphlet. It may not have been uh, initially produced by the Milwaukee Road, but the Milwaukee Road certainly distributed this pamphlet. And it was an effort to sort of explain the special features of Montana to would-be farmers. You know, let's say you're a farmer in eastern North Dakota, like my grandparents, you know, or, or someplace in Iowa. And you've heard stories of Montana, you know. Maybe, maybe you'd like to get a shot at it because you can get property for next to nothing. But what about that lack of rain? I mean, should I worry about that? Well, here's what the pamphlet said. And it starts off in a very sort of straightforward, factual way. The state of Montana contains 146,572 square miles. What's that mean? Well, to my students at Carroll, I said it's the same size as Japan. That put it in context, but, you know, this is 1910. Here's another way of saying it. It is as large as the combined area of New York, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Maryland, and Connecticut. Okay, for Easterners now, they have a reference point. The population of Montana is only 400,000 which tells us that this pamphlet was written soon after the 1910 census. It will support, in comfort, 40 times that many. 
multiply 400,000 by 40. That is a lot of people, right? Anybody got their calculator there? 400,000 times 40. 16, 16 million? We would be just like California. <laughs> All that is needed to make one of the greatest states is more capital and more people of the right kind. Yeah, that's always the catch, right? More capital and more people of the right kind. In the next few years, Montana will show the most rapid development ever known in any state. Its mines, its forests, its rich agricultural and grazing lands, its water power will all contribute to make its settlers independent. Okay, that's a word that would resonate with Americans of the early 20th century. Independent. You want to be self-sufficient, right? Wealth awaits those who, properly equipped, will join forces with the state of Montana, and now is the time. So if you hesitate, he who hesitates is lost, right? You're going to do it, you've got to do it now. The construction of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and Puget Sound Railway, that was the name they used then, through the state of Montana from east to west has opened to settlement thousands of acres of farmland that can now be homesteaded or purchased at low prices. Uh, those prices would vary, but anywhere from a dollar an acre to maybe eight dollars an acre. These lands in a few years will double or triple in value. Okay, so even if you don't want to stay for 20 years, just stay there for three. Get title to the land, and then you could turn another profit. The kind of settler desired. The ideal settler from Montana, and the one we are trying to reach, is the man who has made a moderate success in the East, but who is too ambitious to be satisfied with slow progress <laughs> and too wise to overlook the great opportunities in the West. Okay, so if you say yes to this invitation, that means by definition you're one of the wise ones. <laughs> the young man especially should go to Montana. That state, while rich in natural resources, is just beginning to be developed making it an ideal place to get a start. Montana is the last of the good states to be developed, the last best place, <laughs> and will be settled with a rush. Land values will quickly increase and make large profits for those who go early. So again, don't, don't wait. Now is the time to move. And, and in fact, this was true to some degree, and a lot of the homesteaders who came, especially as families, tended to be young adults in their 20s and 30s who had farmed in other places but decided that if they came to Montana, they would have an even better shot at success. Climate. Oh, this is where the story starts to get a little more interesting. <laughs> the, climate of the climate in Montana is excellent. The clear, dry air is extremely invigorating and one of the most healthful and pleasant in the world. I was, recently came back from Korea, and that's what I told my Korean hosts. Montana is a great place to live. No one need fear the winters of Montana. <laughs> some of my favorite lines of this. They are tempered by the warm Chinook winds and by the mountains. The summer days are long, and although at midday the sun is quite hot, Sunstrokes are unknown. The nights are always cool and pleasant. Montana has never known a tornado or cyclone. Montana has no disease particular to the country, and its dry atmosphere will cure afflictions of the nose, throat, and lungs. The state has a number of hot springs that are noted, as if farmers would have free time for that. The summers of Montana are noted by the long days, giving many nights of sunlight for the growing crops. Plowing begins in March and ends usually in November. Well, that's what it says. Now, now the, next, the next statement is all in caps to drive home the point. One important fact will be noted. In Montana, more than two-thirds of the moisture falls during the growing season. Now, I mean, that, that, well, that could be true, 
You know, traditionally May, you know, May and May and June could be sort of the wet months, but by emphasizing when the rainfall comes, it doesn't talk about how much actually comes. Soil. Again, there's some truth here. The soil of Montana varies with the different districts, but generally it is an alluvial deposit, a gray loam of extreme fertility from 2 to 40 feet in depth. No question has ever been raised regarding fertility of Montana soils. Well, I, in general, I would agree with that. Another important property of Montana soil is that it is of a proper consistency for a country of light rainfall. This is the first time that that's been mentioned, right? The rainfall. It works and pulverizes readily, making the task easy of keeping a dust mulch on top for conservation of moisture. And that was one of the things that, uh, that Hardy Campbell preached with the deep cultivation. <coughs> the soil is heavy enough that this dust, dust blanket does not blow away. Well, we'll see about that. Besides these advantages, it is a soil that readily absorbs and holds moisture. <coughs> now, again, if you're unfamiliar with Montana, but you had some experience as a farmer, and you read this description, you might say, that looks like pretty good country to me. I think that's uh, worth a shot. And in fact, tens of thousands of people did exactly that. Uh, the numbers are amazing. Collectively, these homesteaders would settle on roughly 32 million acres before these two decades were over. Between 1909 and 1923, during this 15-year period, almost 115,000 claim, homestead claims, so I'm not talking about purchasing land from the railroads, but homestead claims. Between 1909 and 1923, almost 150,000 homestead claims were made involving 2.5 million acres of land. Uh, sometimes the rush was so fast that uh, it made your head spin. In the Great Falls office, for example, where homestead claims were, were written up. <clears throat> in, in the year of 1910, between 1,000 and 1,500 claims were filed each month. That's each month, okay? Multiply that by 12 months, that's just Great Falls, then multiply that by all these other offices that are set up across Montana. Uh, it's an amazing story. And in fact, 1910 in many ways would sort of signal the boom within the boom, which would run for roughly eight years or so, from about 1910 to 1918. People by the tens of thousands were pouring into Montana. And they were doing so because of all the reasons that I've just mentioned. But also because of special factors that were occurring. One of those was the rather generous rainfall that took place during the early and mid-teens of that second decade. You know, it looked as though rain really did follow the plow. That in fact, and for the people who had arrived in Montana since 1900, they had no sort of collective memory of droughts. They had never lived through a Montana drought. So it seemed as though this was the new norm. And in fact, crop yields were often amazing. The average, in many agricultural areas, the, the average crop yield was about 25 bushels of wheat per acre. In some places, as high as 50 bushels. And prices? Prices were good, again, in part because of that growing demand in the east. But then what happens in 1914? World War I breaks out in Europe. And suddenly, an entire generation of young men in countries like England, France, Germany are marched off to war. They're no longer there 
to grow their own foodstuffs. They have to get their food from someplace else, and America is more than happy to provide. In fact, something astounding takes place. Uh, between 1914 and 1916, American exports to England and France alone go from roughly $700 million per year to almost $3 billion in a single year. And that's even before the U.S. directly enters the war. So as soon as the war breaks out in Europe, the demand for American agricultural products, particularly Montana wheat, would skyrocket. And then in the spring of 1917, America joins the fight directly, which creates an even greater demand for American agricultural products. So Montana farmers are not only getting these bountiful crops each year, but they're also getting top dollar for those crops. You know that old rule, supply and demand? Usually you think if, if these are bumper crops, there will be an excess of supply and thus demand will go down. But thanks in part to these huge cities growing in the east, thanks primarily to World War I, the demand is going even faster than the supply, and so they're getting top dollar. But just as everything seems to be almost perfect, catastrophe strikes. You know, if this is the greatest boom in Montana history, then it also turns out to be the greatest bust. Let, let me give you some numbers first. Between roughly 1919 and 1925, 11,000 farms in Montana are vacated. Between 1919 and 1925, roughly half of all Montana farmers would lose their land. Half! Between 1920 and 1926, 214 Montana banks would close their doors. 214, does that sound like a lot? That was half of all the banks in Montana. And, and why are they forced to close their doors? It's because those banks had made loans to farmers who were expanding their operations in the mid-teens, thinking that the glory days would never end. When they came to, and I'll tell you in just a second, why they come to a halt. But when that happens, then these banks are forced to foreclose on these mortgages. But of course, many farmers simply don't have the capital to make those payments, so no one's around to really buy up these old mortgages. So again, within a half decade, half of all banks in Montana close. And remember that this is before you have something like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That's a byproduct of the Great Depression in the 1930s. There is no FDIC, and that means that if you were a farmer, like my grandfather, he never lost his farm, but he had stuck some money away for when the bad times might come. He had put about $5,000 into the local bank. This was in North Dakota, not Montana, but it's a somewhat similar story. When the bank closes its doors, he loses every cent. You know, it doesn't have any assets. You don't get anything out of the bank. So it's not only those farmers who had been a bit more cautious in expanding their operations, who had pretty much hadn't taken out loans but had uh, paid their bills on time, had followed this more conservative approach. If they had money in the bank, that's all wiped out. If you're a store owner on Main Street, in one of these little towns that springs up in eastern Montana as part of the homestead boom, then you've lost everything as well, and so it ripples through the state's economy like never before. Now, what had produced this? Well, you could blame a lot of different people. You could blame Jim Hill, and certain historians like Joseph Kinsey Howard did exactly that for overselling Montana, for 
for sort of shaping the truth to suit their own needs. Or you could blame the farmers themselves for being a bit too ambitious, for not doing their homework, but in many ways it was beyond their own local control. The two primary forces that brought about this disaster was a horrific drought that would hit Montana. It actually begins in 1917, when things still look pretty good. You know, prices are very high then, but, but this drought starts to creep into north-central Montana. By 1918, it then sweeps through most of the rest of the eastern two-thirds of the state. By 1919, it's actually making its way across the mountains into certain parts of western Montana. Now, these things had happened in the past, but not in the recent past, not in the memory of these people who were part of the homestead boom. You know, and, and if you're getting any crop whatsoever, instead of getting 25 bushels per acre, now you're getting maybe two and a half bushels per acre. And that simply isn't enough to service the loans that you may have taken out to expand your operation. So one factor here is the drought. Now, we know from today these things are cyclical, and they'll hit Montana every 10, 20 years, whatever the case may be. But these people weren't prepared for that. But along with the drought, and again, that might have been bad enough, but sadly, the end of World War I then also releases all of those soldiers throughout Europe to go back to their homes, back to their farms, to grow their own crops once more. And so suddenly the floor falls out of agricultural prices. So farmers are getting very little for the crops they can grow. It's that double whammy, if you will. The collapse of ag prices and this drought, this unprecedented drought that devastates Montana, Montana farmers during this period. How bad is it? Well, again, the numbers I've given you suggest that half the banks close. One out of every two farmers would lose his or her farm. But it's beyond just that. When the Montana census was taken in 1930, the next one after 1920, census takers discovered that there were roughly 11,000 people fewer living in Montana than there had been in 1920. But, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. Uh, we now estimate that about 60,000 people left the state in the early 1920s as a result of these conditions I've just talked about. 60,000, maybe even more than that, but at least 60,000 people left the state. Of course, a few new folks came in, usually not as farmers, maybe as 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 uh, uh, copper miners, smelter workers. A few babies were born, but it wasn't enough. And here's the most glaring fact of all. How many states were in the United States in 1930? It's kind of a trick question. Not 50, right? It's 48. 48 states in the United States in 1930. Out of those 48 states, 47 have a net growth of population from 1920 to 1930. 47 out of 48 grow during the roaring 20s. Only one has a net loss, and that one state out of 48 is Montana. When you put it within that national context, then I think you get to begin to appreciate just how devastating this collapse was. And I would argue that it's so extensive, it's so traumatic, that it really changes the face of Montana. It changes the flavor of Montana in a fundamental way. When I taught my course on Montana History at Carroll College for those many years, I often said to students, this was the watershed moment in Montana's history. The water flowed in one direction up to that point in time and another direction after that. And in what ways? Well, part of it had to do with the psychology of the place, that, that Montana was a land of unbridled optimism up to this crash. 
Not that you're always going to make it rich or always going to be successful. There were plenty of failures along the way, but this was an exciting young place. And if you were ambitious, if you were willing to work hard, there was a good chance that you were going to have some kind of success. This land of unbridled optimism. You would rarely see that among Montanans after the 1920s. A new term is sort of coined. It had been around for a while, but it, it really resonates with Montanans. Montanans, after the 1920s, learned to hunker down. Right? Any of us who come from agricultural backgrounds, we know the term. But in a sense, it applies to society writ large. That if you take too many risks, if you're too ambitious, you're going to face failure. So you need to be cautious. You need to be able to hunker down. That was a dramatic change for the people of Montana. Demographically, Montana goes from being a land of young people with young ambitions to almost overnight a much older society. You know, those 60,000 who left, uh, they weren't children because children can't walk away on their own. They weren't the older people who were sort of settled in one fashion or another. They tended to be the young adults in their families. Those were the ones who would leave. And although this is, a, this is a sweeping generalization, I'm inclined to say that that's been a trend in Montana for the last 80 years or so. Those of us who have children often have to wave goodbye to them when they see, seek other opportunities in other places. And then lastly, another reason I think this serves as a kind of watershed up until the 1920s, Montana in many ways was seen as this kind of frontier society, right? It was a series of, of frontiers. It might be the fur trapper frontier, or it might be uh, the placer mining frontier, it might be the cattle frontier, the ranching frontier, or the homestead frontier, but, but it was almost as though Montana had gone from infancy to senior citizenship overnight. Now, that's a gross exaggeration, I know that. But one reason it attracted so many people during this period of the homestead boom was because it seemed like the last best place. In the sense, that it was the last chance at that frontier adventure and to seize the brass ring. After 1920, that mindset is much more difficult to imagine in Montana that the bust that occurs in Montana agriculture in the 1920s would haunt Montana and Montanans for decades and for generations to come. Okay, I had promised Martha that I would spend a few minutes taking questions. It looks like we only have about four minutes, but that's better than nothing at all, so I might be able to at least take one or two questions.